a pleasure to be here in the Parliament and to discuss with you because uh, we need your support and you need to be very much close to what's happening, what we are doing, what we plan to do. As David said, I'm just landed from the from the Wolf, and additionally, you had the bad idea of changing the hour and take one hour less to my schedule. So I came back from the report quickly in order not to be late. I haven't been late, thanks for waiting me some minutes. And as you said, I am not here as high representative, but as vice president, talk about the... But it's quite difficult, you know. It's more and more difficult to put a border line between what is the vice president and the high representative. I think that, that, that's why they wanted to put both tasks in a single person, because uh, that it, foreign affairs is a continuum. You cannot say, until here's the commission, and then there's another institution. So um, I will uh, unavoidably to go uh, further of the commission competences and have a broader approach. Is someone talking about me? No. And have a broad approach to the to the wider world, because many of the things I'm going to say escape of the of the competences of the commission. Although the commission is fully engaged, and this is the the real interest of having someone double-headed. Look, uh, what we are doing uh, to do this semester first, energy, energy so high in the agenda, and every day more. Nothing more geopolitical or more geostrategic than energy. So this uh, month of May, um, we are going to present the strategy on international energy engagement. It's go together with the Repower European Union, the, com the communication that the Commission we approved last week. And you can imagine how important it is at that moment to see which is our international engagement on energy. And coming from the Gulf, I can tell you, it's still more. Because when you go there and you say, well, how, much, how much gas are you going to produce? How much gas are you going to need? Well, it depends on our dependency. It, it's at the core of the international politics today. The second one, uh, it's about the Gulf. Because the Gulf is becoming more and more on a strategic region for us. And that's what I went there, jumping a couple of days, we are going to present a communication, a joint communication, together with me, the Commission High Rep, on how to partner with the Gulf. And the third issue, it's a less dramatic issue, but not less important, it's uh, the governance of the oceans. I've said many times that uh, one of the battlefields of the future will be at seas. Well, a lot of battles will be taking place on the seas, on the oceans. So we need to discuss about it, uh, and another joint communication will be approved in June. And then in September, which is uh, the European Year of Youth, we will also present a joint action plan on the external action of the European Union related to youth. We are also workers, working towards, uh, now it's working. Well, I don't mean that to prepare communication or strategy is not working, but now on more practical and concrete things, we are working towards the widest possible international condemnation and isolation of Russia. You know perfectly that we have got a resounding support and in a second nation general assembly resolution last week. 140 instead of 141, and only four countries aligned with Russia. But let's take care. Don't be so sure that uh, this wider international support corresponds to a rocky, solid support that can continue forever. I'm coming from the Gulf, and I had a lot of discussions with uh, many people in the region, foreign affairs ministers, and this vote in Yunga cannot be taken for granted. There is an underlying trend and thinking about the Western world, you have to spend a lot of work and energy trying to explain this is not the war, a war between the West and the East. But in Africa, we have to think seriously about the vote in Africa. There is an underlying approach of all reflects of colonialism, anti-colonialism, the Russian role, 
link with, uh, in one side, romantic considerations about uh, what Russia did in order to help them to get out of the colonial system, and on the other hand, very tactical considerations about the interest of each one, what Russia can do for them, what they are expecting from Russia. And the concept of global south is being, is being coded. The global south. Many ministers in, in, uh, in, in the Doha, in the Doha Forum, refer to that. And the war between Ukraine, uh, Russia against aggressing Ukraine, and the Russia leaning to, to China, and the position of India and South Africa, I think that this requires a lot of uh, attention from our side. There are other conflicts, the Middle East, Syria, and Iraq, and Yemen, the issue of food security, who will be very high in the agenda, that will make uh, many countries to consider, in, uh, first, from the point of view of their national interests, the second, from the point of view of the, the new geopolitical landscape, which is the way they look at this war, not only from the point of view of principles, principles, that's okay, but there are many other things that rules the international relations, which at the end continues to be a fight of power than uh, moral or principle considerations. So I convey clearly and loudly that uh, the Russian invasion was, was above all, uh, an attack against international community role, rules, that we're attacking all of us, that it's not just Ukraine or the Europeans, the neighbors who are in danger, it's the international community. But to, we need to be very specific, and keeping in mind that partners, what do, what do they understand, and how do they perceive the conflict, and avoid losing these countries to the Russia camp. I think that there is a very fertile and interest field for discussions, considerations, analysis, mm -hmm and political decisions. And we need to genuinely listen to our partners and address their concerns when possible. And I got a lot of criticism, for example, for uh, voting against the South Africa resolution not to be put at vote at the United Nations General Assembly. And then there is the issue of uh, disinformation. You cannot imagine how effective is the Russia disinformation. You cannot imagine the story of this Russian boy who was crucified in Donbas uh, by the Ukrainians, which is, in, for me, means something related to the Middle Ages, the stories of the Middle Ages, but uh, and certainly has been completely, uh, completely clarified and never happened. But that's still there, no? And about food security, we will have to face a strong push of disinformation, saying that this is the consequences, this is the fault of the sanctions. The sanctions will produce this food insecurity. It's not the sanctions, it's the war itself. But um, when people are in trouble, they look for a scapegoat. And then we have to take especially care of what's happening in our immediate neighborhood when we want to fight the anti-European narrative, and I am thinking in the Balkans first and in Africa after. Africa will be very much affected by this uh, instability created by food problems. And Russia is certainly spinning uh, to put the responsibility in our camp. This is fueling this older anti-colonial narrative and reminiscences of the Cold War dynamics, which are still a little bit there. But the facts are there. Putin continues deflecting any blame for the atrocities committed against Ukraine. We are supporting the investigation opened by the International Criminal Court. We will provide support to the Office of the Prosecutor about everything related with the war crimes and crimes against humanity. He will continue fighting against disinformation, manipulation, interference with the means and tools that we have that certainly are a little bit below the ones that the Russia have. Recently, at this plenary, I announced concrete steps and I outlined the further development of a European Union toolbox to address these issues. And we need to, to, to have more awareness and more societal resilience as, by the way, 
it is clearly stated in the strategic compass. I said that the immediate neighborhood should be a specific area of interest for us, and I come in also from a travel from the Western Balkans, and there you see certainly how the Russia influence is incredibly high in some countries, some of them and some candidates has not aligned with our with our sanctions. Well, then there is the issue of the refugees, the people fleeing the aggression against Russia. There is a strong consensus on the external dimension of this new pact of migration and asylum. People ask me, this is the occasion maybe for you to rethink about it and to take strong decisions. I tell them they are not migrants, they are asylum seekers. But there is also a wide criticism about us saying, well, you don't treat the same asylum seekers. In this case, your attitude is completely different than you took when the asylum seekers were Syrians in the 15 and 16. In any case, we have to push for this pact of migration and asylum because uh, we need it. We have activated the directive on temporary protection and we work uh, with the third countries in order to achieve sustainable solutions for various humanitarian needs. Then comes uh, international energy engagement and the new repower initiative. I don't have to spend a lot of time to convince you that how important it is to recover, to go back to the, to be free of this uh, energy dependency from Russia, uh, energy prices. If we want to eliminate our fossil dependency from Russia, be prepared also to have a big problems in the short term, high turbulences on prices. The more people refill the stocks, the more the prices will go up because to refill the stocks means increased demand and increased demand means increased prices. Our energy diplomacy will be essential in order to get uh, alternative supplies for gas and oil. And that's why this uh, international energy engagement strategy will be an important part of our foreign policy. For once, geopolitical issues will be hand in hand with the fight against climate, because at the end, what matters is to reduce the consumption of uh, hydrocarbons. We will focus on three priorities, security supply, certainly, more than ever, Acceleration of the energy transition. Uh, we have to reduce our consumption. Once during this crisis, I said that if everybody decreases one degree the temperature in their houses, we can save 7% of the consumption. Someone laughed at that, but uh, it's something as clear as this. There is a time for practicing a certain austerity on energy consumption. And the third is support of our neighbors. When I was in Albania and in North Macedonia two weeks ago, it was clear for them that they want to be part of any strategy. Don't do with us the same things that we did with the vaccines. That at the beginning we were taken apart. Include us in any kind of a strategy. Well, for them a strategy means also support because the food prices are already creating big, big problems in these countries. Then the Gulf. And that's what I went to Kuwait and Qatar, to the Doha Forum. It's more and more relevant for us, what's happening in the world. They have their own political and security profile. Iran is there. The GCPOA, it's not uh, getting to an end. It seems that uh, two weeks ago we almost had it, and Russia came saying that Russia was obstructing and being again the finalization of the deal because if the Iran starts producing oil, it will be more supply in the markets. That's not on the interest of Russia. Well, this has been overcome, this difficulty, and now we have others related with things that at the end are not part of the nuclear deal. They are collateral, like the status of the Revolutionary Guard in Iran. But for the Gulf countries, security means nuclear, it means Iran, it means the whole difficulties in the region with the war in Yemen, 
continuing, although it's not in the newspapers, it's in reality. I intend to continue supporting the Baghdad Conference for Cooperation and Partnership Process. I think it's an opportunity in which we have to engage. There were po positive political developments in the region, the reconciliation, uh, thanks, among other things, of the good work of the Kuwait, the reconciliation between the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, normalization of the agreements with Israel. We are developing the existing human rights dialogues. It's clear that from the point of view of human rights, we still have a certain different patterns, but the only way of uh, trying to approach these patterns is continue working with them and developing this uh, dialogue. Well, uh, I am going to, be go to go quicker. The governance of the oceans. This is something which is not, doesn't produce a lot of headlines. But it's a global responsibility. Someone can consider that the oceans is a kind of no man's land. They don't belong to anyone. Areas beyond any national jurisdiction. But uh, even if uh, the European Union, the global community have made progress in recent years to improve governance, I think much more needs to be done. We need to promote a shared and integrated management to effectively tackle pollution, biodiversity losses, and other impacts coming from human activities. The law of the sea, more cooperation, more dialogue, a stronger partnership, and uh, to face the conflicts that uh, the violation of the law of the sea can produce in the oceans. And the last one, the last one is this uh, action plan for the European Union, taking into account the youth, Youth people across the world are very much actively engaged in the implementation of the Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Youth Peace and Security Agenda. This generation, this young generation, has been severely hit by the COVID pandemic, and now they see the war appearing on their radar screen. The war was something that we took out of our imagination, something that would never happen again. And now the war is in our borders, and there is a certain concern about uh, what's going to happen with this war. It's going to be spreading around, being contained in the border of Ukraine. But the, the, our youth has been facing, first, the pandemic, second, the war, third, climate change. Their future is certainly uh, put at risk. The digital transformation will change the pattern of work, and we want to promote, we need to promote youth empowerment and participation. When you see, once again, the demographic imbalances between Europe and Africa, Europe and the rest of the world, this is one of the most challenging dynamics that we are facing. The biggest imbalance in the world will be the demographic one. When you see the number of youth people in Europe and the number of youth people in Africa, this cannot be, this will not be sustainable. So either we take their products or we take their people in order to balance these tendencies which are not vanishing but by the contrary increasing. We have to work together with the United Nations. We cannot pretend now ourselves 5% of the world population to have a strategy that could influence the whole world. world. The United Nations is doing a lot of efforts in order to support uh, the efforts of the young people. And at the same time, we can be, we cannot be just in the hands of the United Nations agencies because we are going to lose visibility. Well, these are more or less the, the main lines of uh, my introduction to the debate. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Vice President, Thank for you. attending <laughs> our I've been meeting. And uh, let's kick off now with our structured dialogue. We have time exactly till 7 o'clock, so roughly uh, one hour.